Okay, we'll get into what we're going to go over today. Uh, I am putting all of the tutorial notes up on a blog that I have at the following address, dave.if90.net. Okay, so there's a bunch of material that doesn't lend itself well to being uploaded to the blackboard, so I'm aggregating uh, pretty much all of the tutorial content uh, on this blog. So there's a menu up here, KIB216, and then a submenu tutorials, and if you click on week two, that's where you'll find today's materials. So I've uploaded a uh, slide share uh, thing of the lecture that I gave yesterday. So you can view that if you uh, want to review uh, the material there. You can also download it as a PDF. I also screencasted the lecture, so that's up on YouTube. You can view that, and it's also a link to download that if you want to go back and review that uh, in its entirety as well. And I'll be doing a similar thing for the tutorials, screencasting them and then putting them up uh, because we do go through quite a lot of material and it can be good to go back and, and review things. Sometimes you won't make logical connections uh, to things in a tutorial until a couple of weeks later. So I will endeavour to put as much of this material up as I can. Uh, it's definitely not a substitute for actually turning up to the tutorials. Uh, but. Uh, hopefully it will be helpful once you sort of get into the assignment and you start to go, oh, okay, that stuff from tutorials a few weeks ago is starting to make some sense. Better go back and, and review it again. Uh, I've put up a copy, essentially, of what's on the QT Blackboard for the assignment one because uh, I thought we should uh, briefly go over that. I've got a little disclaimer note here that this is just a, a copy and paste from what's on the blackboard. Now, if it's possible that the the text on the on the blackboard assignment brief may change, so you should always check back to the the, the blackboard copy as the authoritative source on that. Uh, but this is just to keep it with with the other material for today as well. So essentially, the first assignment is going to be creating a portfolio website uh, for your work and we're going to be using the WordPress platform to create that. So the first half of the semester is going to be basically installing WordPress and then learning how to see that and then that will form the basis of your first assignment. So uh, that's sort of listed off uh, what what's involved with that. So obviously, first of all, you need to install and configure the CMS. Uh, WordPress is the one that we're going to use. Uh, if you're really keen on using a different platform, uh, we're open to that, but make sure that you okay it with me beforehand. Uh, so next week, we'll actually go through the process of how you do that. Um, many people might already be familiar with that, but we're going to go over it again anyway. Number two, you have to create a custom template and style sheet for the CMS. So the project itself is creating a portfolio for your work. So this is something that you're going to need uh, for your sort of post-study career. Uh, undoubtedly, portfolio is really the first thing that anyone who wants to work with you is probably going to want to look at. Uh, people in this industry don't really care so much what marks you got or... Uh, anything like that, they really want to see what work that you've done. Uh, so your work is the thing that speaks speaks the loudest, which is kind of good in a way. Um, so uh, there's a bit of information on that. Uh, I won't necessarily go through that in detail. Uh, part three, so part, part two is really the, the major component of it. Creating the theme is going to take up most of the time. And then part three is extending the CMS with a plugin. Now, uh, you can create your own plugin if you want, but the you can get away with the minimum for this part by essentially just installing a pre-built plugin, which is quite straightforward, and we'll go over that as well. And then the important part, which uh, is easy to forget to do well, 
uh, but is very important is the report. So just as important as creating the work itself is your ability to communicate your design process and your design intentions and then justify those based on how you say that they respond to the brief. Okay, so often overlooked in communication design is the communication aspect. Uh, you can be the greatest artist in the world, but if you can't uh, justify why your creation responds to a particular brief, a particular set of guidelines that you've been given, then really you're not a successful designer, you're just a great artist. Uh, so that involves things like reviewing websites, getting your inspiration, um, and then also things like demonstrating your design process. So what we do want you to do is keep track of, of your progress as you're going through this. Uh, how you do that's kind of a little bit up to you, uh, but I would suggest writing down notes and taking screenshots of the work that you do each week as you progress towards a completed uh, portfolio website. And we do suggest that you have as part of the blog that process. So, so whether that's a separate blog, so you might want to create a Tumblr which just uh, lists your design process that you've gone through for the assignment, you can do that, but at the same time, uh, that, that design process documentation might be really good initial content to fill out your uh, WordPress template and test it with some content. Now there is a little bit of a question there, well how do we put content in there while we're actually working on it? Uh, you can still do that, so there's an admin section and a front end section of uh, the WordPress platform, so you can still create posts and, and add all the content without actually having uh, the, the front end theme uh, complete. So, but we won't worry too much about that this week, we'll get more into that next week. But I do just want you to be thinking from the very beginning about recording your process so that once you've finished the portfolio as part of your report it becomes very easy to look back and you don't have to remember what you did and what your process was and hash it together at the end. So that will ultimately be then delivered as a formalised report. So the, the two main components of the assignment that we'll get is the portfolio website itself and you'll submit that as a URL link uh, on the discussion board on the blackboard and then also a downloadable document so to come look at your report. Uh, because you're never just going to deliver a completed work, uh, you're going to have to justify how it adheres to the brief that you've been given. So I really want you to treat this as uh, where the client giving you a brief and the brief just happens to be create your own portfolio website, but we want you to be able to say, yes, okay, I've understood the brief and this is how I've created a work which adheres to the guidelines in the brief. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We'll obviously get more into the assignment as we start to work on it in the tutorials, but uh, it's good to start uh, be aware of what it's going to be now because there are things that you can already start to do now like uh, look at various different portfolio websites and web design trends and all that sort of thing and that's what the poster that Deb talked about which is uh, now due in week five is about. Uh, so we want you to essentially identify what you think are the uh, important trends or uh, attributes of a website like the one that you'll be creating. So we're looking at things like CMSs, uh, modern web technologies and all that sort of thing. But again, we'll get more into that uh, in the lecture next week. I'll be giving a lecture on CMSs. Uh, it's good that we've, we've done this same unit with the same uh, assignments a couple of times now. So I do have some examples of some of the assignments from last year, which is always good, so that you can see what other students have done. Uh, it will sort of let you gauge your expectations a little better. Uh, so there's a gallery here of some of the various different designs. Uh, I think I might just need to...
get my internet working. Okay, so you can view, view the galleries. I've taken screenshots of them because what tends to happen uh, is people will change their URLs or change their web hosting and it's hard to see the, see the work that students have done uh, a few years after the fact because it tends to move. Uh, but you can have a look at some of the, the various different portfolios that people have done. I tried to pick some of the better ones but also some of the more varied. So you can see depending on depending on the type of work that the, the student was particularly into, was particularly part of their portfolio, really informed some of the design. So some of them are very technically oriented, others are very uh, visually oriented and so the, the interface and the visual design choices uh, for the successful ones were very much influenced by that. So that's going to be a big thing that I'm going to keep talking about throughout the course of our tutorials is that the, the design of your website is going to all be about context and in particular the context of the content that you're going to put in your portfolio is going to inform the design. Okay, so it doesn't make sense to have long sprawling uh, articles of text describing in detail ad infinitum uh, your process for doing a piece of graphic design or photography if you don't actually post a picture of what that looks like. Okay, so it's kind of obvious but um, this is something you've got to keep in mind when you're looking at other portfolio websites. There's never ever just one set of rules that you follow these and that's going to make an awesome portfolio website. You've got to think about the kind of content that is going to go in that website and what what web design is going to service that content the best. And that's going to differ individually based on, on the type of work that you're into or the type of work that you've already produced. So really one of your first steps is going to figure out what kind of work is your area. Now that may be very specific or it may be diverse. So if it's very specific then you're going to have a consistent looking interface across all sections of your portfolio probably. If it's very varied, you happen to be sort of have a lot of areas that you're interested in or a lot of areas that you have work uh, in or intend to work in then you should uh, sort of make um, allowances for what that content's going to be uh, and the more that you do that and think about that at the beginning then the less uh, chance there is that you're going to get a year or two down the track and go, oh, I've got this different kind of content now and my original design doesn't really fit. So that's the kind of stuff that you can be thinking about already. Uh, I've also got links here to all of those uh, pictures posted there. Uh, so uh, you can actually go through and, and navigate the sites and see what they look like. So that's really useful having the benefit of, of previous work from other students. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the assignment for now. Are there any questions on any of that so far? No? Okay. If anyone has questions at any time, feel free to yell out and I'll answer them as best I can. Okay, so the next uh, post is we're going to start looking at your web design slash development process. And the first thing you really need to look at is what tool set you're going to use. Now you may very well already have a favorite tool set, a favorite process, that's fine and I definitely don't expect you to adhere to the one that I use. Um, you're going to develop your own, own tool set and your own processes as you go through. Uh, however, if you, if you haven't really thought about that yet, then I've got a few suggestions of things that you're likely to need. So, uh, the first one I think is really valuable and this is something that I didn't really appreciate the value of until I'd done quite a few things is uh, actually having somewhere to keep your notes. Um, now that could be a piece of paper, it could be a Word document, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I found a particularly useful uh, style of program is these ones like uh, Evernote, it's one I use. Uh, 
Um, there's a similar one that Microsoft makes called OneNote. Uh, Evernote's good in that it's free, it's cross-platform. Uh, there's a screenshot of it here. That's essentially what the interface looks like. And it's good for just quickly getting uh, ideas out of your head and storing them somewhere. You can categorize them into folders, tag them, we'll take text, uh, images, videos, documents, whatever you want. We'll even do um, uh, optical character recognition on, uh, on photos of text so that you can search through that as well. And I really started to appreciate uh, this sort of tool when I started working on lots of different things at once. And that's something that you're already kind of doing, doing multiple units at university, so uh, I really would recommend having some formalized way of storing your notes. Uh, you don't have to worry about formatting anything prettily, it's just a way of being able to dump stuff down and knowing that you're going to be able to find it again when you need it. So I use, I use Evernote for all sorts of things, from uh, writing tutorials to having work meetings to um, doing preliminary documentation on projects and so forth. But as I said, um, you may not want something that's structured. If a, if a pen and paper works for you, then that's perfectly fine as well. Uh, obviously, we're going to need a code editor, and uh, we could spend an entire year looking at all the different code editors out there. Okay, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands. And again, this will likely come down to a personal preference, depending on depending on how large the scale of the project you work on is, how much you end up getting into the programming side rather as, uh, as opposed to the design side. So again, I can't really tell you this is the one particular one that you should use. But I have provided a link to uh, part of a Wikipedia article which lists a whole uh, bunch of ones, uh, including uh, free ones, which are always good because they're free. Um, in terms of the software that's on these computers, uh, I just quickly looked. The Macs have an editor, which is a, sort of a general code editor. It's also quite good for web stuff called BB Edit. Uh, so if you're working on stuff today uh, and you're using the Macs, you can use that one. Uh, the PCs, I believe, have one called Komodo Edit, which is a free version of the full Komodo uh, web IDE. Uh, that's a free one, so if you end up working on the PCs and you like that, you can actually download that for free to use at home as well. Uh, if you're into paying for editors, uh, if you're on the Mac platform, a couple of good ones for sort of very visual-based uh, HTML and CSS coding is there's one called Espresso, uh, there's another one called Coda. They cost about sort of 20, 30, 40 bucks, something like that. Um, but they're, they're quite good for, for very visual design process. There's obviously Dreamweaver, which has been around forever, um, which is, uh, despite what anyone might say about it, is quite a good editor. People trash it because it has sort of like, um, what you see is what you get editing, where you can drag stuff and it makes, or used to make terrible code, but as a code editor by itself, it, it's actually quite good. Uh, although expensive, if you tend to, if you intend to pay for it, I think it's about four hundred dollars, uh, and I don't think they've had installed it on any of the uni computers. If you want something very simple, there's a program called Notepad Plus Plus, which is sort of an extension of, of Windows Notepad, which gives you tabs and syntax highlighting and all this sort of stuff. So again, I, I. Um, I can't specifically recommend anything. All I would suggest is have a look at some of them, look at reviews online, try a few of them out. Um, the one that I'm using that I really like at the moment is called, uh, uh, there's two versions of it. There's PHP Storm, which is for PHP, and then there's one called WebStorm, which is just HTML, CSS, made by a company called JetBrains. That's actually commercial software, but if you email them and tell them that you're a student at university, they'll actually send you a free license to use it uh, for as long as you want. Uh, so that's good as well. There's also um, there's a bunch of editors based on a platform called Eclipse, which is cross-platform Java-based general code editing IDE, IDE standing for Integrated Development Environment. 
and uh, of those there's one that's quite good uh, for out of the box code editing called Aptana, A-P-T-A-N-A, -A, Aptana Studio, so that might be worth a look as well. So I could go on forever and ever about um, IDEs, I've, but really the best way is to download them, try them and see what suits you best. Um, I know that's what I've done, I've probably wasted way too much time doing that. Okay, so code editor, that's pretty obvious. Uh, what we're going to need when we start needing to transfer files between your computer and a web server is an FTP client. So FTP is File Transfer Protocol. Uh, it's a network uh, communication protocol for the transfer of files. And an FTP client essentially looks something like a explorer or a finder window uh, for browsing files, but instead of browsing files on your hard drive, you're browsing files on a remote computer. So uh, this is one example of one uh, called FileZilla, which again is free and cross-platform. Uh, it's the one that I use, there are others, um, and again, feel free to try various different ones. Uh, but this one's really quite good. This is a screenshot of the interface, and essentially you need to give it uh, three bits of information to connect to a web server. You need to give it the address of the web server, and then a username and a password. Now those are things that uh, if you have, uh, that you, your web server, whether you purchase that web server space or whether that web server is the one that's on QUT, uh, you'll be given that information in order to connect to the web server. And once you're connected, it will load up a directory structure and you can then essentially use it like a explorer window or a finder window. You can just drag files from your computer uh, to the FTP window or, or vice versa and you can upload and download files to the server. Uh, and then obviously it's because it has to go over the network it needs a little bit of time to transfer those but you'll see in, in the bottom part here you get um, usually a overview of, of what's transferring and, and how long it's going to take. Now depending on the development environment that you use, uh, lots of them integrate FTP into that directly which can streamline your workflow because instead of editing a file on your computer, saving it and then dragging it to the FTP client to upload it, what you can do is make a connection within your code editor to your web server and then open the files directly from the web server into your IDE and then save them and then they automatically upload. So it takes a little bit of configuration to set up and I, I can help you with that but it, it makes the process of editing your code quite a bit quicker. Um, now uh, I should mention at this point that in terms of the web servers that we're, we're going to be using for your assignment you have uh, two options, the highly recommended option and the highly unrecommended option. Um, the highly recommended option is that you actually get your own uh, web hosting and your own domain name uh, because that's something that you're going to need and the alternative option being hosting it on QUT. Once you leave QUT, you're probably not going to want to have to grab all of your portfolio website off the QUT server and then upload it to a new hosting package anyway. So it's something that you'll probably ultimately have to do anyway. So our suggestion is that you are uh, you go the, the own hosting route. I'll mention more on that later, but I only mention it now in relation to the, um, the FTP client, uh, because if you're FTPing to uh, hosting that you've purchased, they'll send you those details in the setup email, and it's quite straightforward. If you're using the QT hosting service, which you've, you've possibly used in previous subjects, it's the, the student.ci.qt, etc. server, uh, then you can connect to that with the FTP client, but due to the uh, extra security and the QT network, you have to do a few extra things to work around that. Now, I do have tutorials on how to set that up, and we'll get to that later when it's more relevant. Uh, but just letting you know that this process is a bit more complicated uh, if you intend to use the QUT hosting. 
Okay, we'll move on to web browsers. Again, this is fairly obvious, but needs talking about as well. Uh, these days, you can pretty much test and develop in uh, any browser of your choice. They've all gotten very uh, kind of good and similar lately. I talked yesterday, yesterday about the, uh, the sort of the second browser wars where after Internet Explorer's dominance, they kind of slacked off, stopped innovating. Their browser stayed the same for a while, which allowed Firefox, Chrome, Opera, these other ones to um, become a lot better and then forcing IE to kind of catch up and, and standardize because they were no, no longer so dominant. So we're in a pretty good place now where, uh, where pretty much all of the major web browsers are suitable um, for, for development. Having said that, the popular one for development remains Mozilla Firefox, mainly because there are a lot of extensions that exist for it, which make uh, developing uh, a bit easier. Uh, so, if you do decide to use Firefox, there are some uh, extensions that I would recommend that you install. Uh, the first one is Firebug. You may or may not have heard of this. Uh, Firebug looks like, I'll just open up Firefox. Firebug is essentially your, uh, your favorite tool. Uh, or your best friend when it comes to uh, doing HTML, CSS development. Uh, now if I just open up a simple website. Okay, so this is this is the my example of the the website for the exercise that I'll be getting you to do uh, later on this, uh, today. It's just a simple uh, simple test website for uh, doing a a standard kind of two column layout with a header, footer, and navigation. So it's quite simple. Um, it's a good one to look at with uh, Firebug. So Firebug, you download the extension, you install it. And once you've done that, uh, it allows you to inspect the uh, code on uh, any web page. And I'm just trying to make more room here. Okay, so let's say, for example, this navigation here. I can right click on that, I can inspect it. And you can see you can drag over any of the elements in the document object model tree. Over here on this pane, you can also uh, click on this little selection icon and hover over uh, hover over elements on the page itself. So this is very useful when, when you're trying to find the the code that relates to a particular visual element on the page sometimes that's a little bit difficult so with this I can hover over various different things and you can see in the in Firebug on the right it will jump to the uh, specific element uh, that I'm hovering over so you can see there on the right that it's jumped to this particular anchor tag within a list item within my navigation list okay so that's the first useful thing is the code inspection but what I can also do is modify this code and see how that changes it uh, in real time. So on, on this uh, pane over here on the right, this is actually my CSS styles that are applied to whatever uh, DOM element that I have selected over here. So I could, for example, select... I could select the the first list item within my uh, navigation menu, and over here, if I zoom in a little bit, okay, you can see that these are all of my CSS styles that are that are applicable to this particular element. So, I have a style that I've said uh, for ID of nav and any list items underneath that. 
do all these different things, including one like display inline block. Now I can disable that and I can see how that changes the layout of this uh, in real time. So if I hover over here, there's a little uh, sort of circle with a, a slash through it. I click that. Okay, and you can see that without the, the display of inline block that it reverts back to the default way that the web browser is going to re render a, a list item which is uh, to render it as block, which means that it takes up the entire width of its containing element and then places them one underneath the, one, one underneath the other. Okay, so uh, I can also type in specific values. So let's say and this is a big time saver as well because you often, when you're visually designing the interface, you have a process of, especially when it comes to things like uh, dimensions, laying things out, padding and margin, margining, uh, you'll, you'll be going back to your code, you'll be adjusting the pixel values, saving it, refreshing it back in the browser, seeing it's a little bit better but still not quite right, going back and then repeating that process until you get it. So what I can actually do is, let's say I want uh, a bit more padding on these list items, then I can just come over here and modify the values here. So at the moment it's got top and bottom padding of 5 pixels and it's got a uh, left and right padding of 15 pixels. So let's say I want to add, let's say I want to change that left right padding from 15 pixels to 25 pixels. I'll make it even more significant so it's easy to see. Let's say 50 pixels. Okay, you can see automatically it refreshes, re-renders the page using now this, this style here. So that's a much quicker way. I can play around with those values, see them update in real time and go, okay, I've got that exact value now, 50 pixels. I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, I can now go back and edit that into my code, save it, and then refresh and it will be saved. So the thing to note is that changing anything here, okay, so I could completely uh, mess around with this. I could actually get, you know, modify some of this content. Uh, I could change the color of this. All right, and uh, all right, make it look really awesome. Uh, but the thing is, as soon as, the thing to remember is these changes are not saved, okay? All they're doing is modifying what's already loaded into the web browser's memory. So I can mess around with this as much as I want. As soon as I come back here and refresh this page, okay, it's going to revert back to whatever the saved version of my document is. So your process should be load up the page, play around with it in, in Firebug, get the values that you want, and then go and write those values into your actual HTML or your CSS code, save them, and then they'll be retained. Uh, one, one other, probably the last thing I'll really talk about um, with Firebug here is, again, a very, a very common, a very common problem that, um, that you run into when you're trying to lay out HTML elements on the web page is that you'll find inexplicable gaps between things that you haven't told to be there. Now that's almost always caused because uh, because the web browser has its own default way of rendering things. So for example, this is my heading one element here, and if I just disable my margin zero, okay, you can see that by default it the web browser is going to give it a certain amount of marginal padding. So I have, I have some various tabs here in my CSS panel and it's got the styles here which I've applied to it specifically but then I can also select this computer tab and this will tell me all of the styles applied to that element whether they come from my uh, style sheet or from the browser's default style sheet. So I can see that Okay, I can see that there's a whole lot of um, there's a whole lot of styles applied to this heading element that I haven't actually specified in my in my style sheet, and that's because 
if we don't specify any styles, the browser still gives uh, the elements default styles because it needs some way of laying them out. So going back to the example I was mentioning, this heading now without any specific styling has margin and padding, but, but that's not very easy to see because I can't visualize the margin and padding unless I give it a background color. So what you'll notice is if I hover over this heading one element, you'll see uh, you'll see here that it has some various different colored boxes around it. Now those actually have meanings and I'm going to use those in conjunction with this third tab up here, okay, the layout tab. Now this is really good for figuring out exactly how much space your element's taking up, whether, it, whether it's visible or invisible space. So again, hovering over this heading one element, you can see that uh, this here essentially represents the various different uh, wrappers of space taking up stuff that exist around my element. So there's the core element itself, which is my heading one text, and it's telling me that the dimension is 472 pixels by 81 pixels. Okay, and then it's, it's showing me that it's got uh, zero padding, and I might actually adjust the padding just so that we can see what, how that's visualized. So I will I can double click here and add a new style. And let's say I give it uh, 10 pixels and 15 pixels padding. Okay, go back to layout. Okay, now there's my 10 pixels top and bottom, 15 pixels left and right padding. And this corresponds with the color scheme over on the left there. So the light blue area that's highlighted over my heading is the dimensions of the element by itself, ignoring any of the other surrounding margin padding or borders. The padding then is represented by that purple outline around it. And then the margin is represented by the, uh, yellow, the yellow border outside of that and the values being all listed here. So while it's not actually visually pushing anything out of the way in a bad way here, that's if, if you have inexplicable uh, gaps within, within your elements on the page, then I can almost guarantee you that most of the time it's going to be uh, unaccounted for marginal padding. So that would be the first thing to do if this was creating weird layouts is to go in and in, inspect that element in Firebug and see, ah, okay, it's got padding and it's got margin that I didn't intend for it to be there. So I can go back and edit the style, uh, set my margin to be zero, and set my uh, padding also to be zero. Okay, and now it's aligning exactly where I want it to be, uh, which is the, the bottom of its containing element. Okay, uh, let's see, anything else to mention about Firebug? There are a heap more tools. You can view various CSS and JavaScripts if you have them. Uh, there's also a console which I'll mention down the track uh, because that's really useful for debugging JavaScript when you add that, uh, but we're not, we're not going to be doing a lot of that until we get into the second assignment, which is uh, uh, the mobile web design or the mobile application design assignment. Okay, but uh, in summary, Firefox, uh, Firebug, um, an awesome tool and will speed up your uh, design process a lot. Now, Firebug was kind of the first one of these kind of tools, but uh, a lot of the other browsers have seen how great that was and they've added their own uh, debugging tool. So if you're using something like uh, Chrome or Safari or even the more recent versions of Internet Explorer, they'll have a similar set of tools and they all operate very similarly. So this is Chrome's version of tools. Again, okay, you can see I can uh, hover over any particular element in the page and see the CSS that's applied to it, uh, disable it, edit it, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so really you're really that expands your choice because you're not limited to using Firefox if you want to use one of these uh, sort of code inspection tools. Uh, so again, my suggestion there is uh, just play around with them, see which one you like best. 
Um, and the more you play around with it, the more features you're going to discover, and then you'll you'll discover something, and you're like, wow, okay, that's going to save me a lot of time. And that's what these tools are all about. These they're about saving time, uh, so that you're uh, not kind of shooting in the dark when you're trying to debug things. Another tool, which is a, another add-on, which is available for Firefox and Chrome, possibly other browsers. I'm not sure. Is the Web, web Developer Toolbar. So uh, that's this one up here. Again, if you just Google these, uh, or I've got links to them as well from the blog, you'll find them and be able to install them as extensions. Uh, you can do things like uh, disabling JavaScript, uh, disabling CSS styles. So I can disable all the CSS styles on this page, which is a good way to test the accessibility of your page, because a good gauge of, of accessibility is if your styles fail to load, whether that's because they're, they're just not loading because there's a problem on the server, or because you have a, a user agent, a browser, which can't actually process those styles, then if it falls back to a, a structure that's still logical, it still has a hierarchy of information, the information is still legible, then uh, that's, that's sort of the first step for, for having an accessible uh, design. So that's good for testing that. So I can I'll refresh that. Uh, yeah, what else have we got? You can display the alt attributes for any images that you have. Make sure you have them. You can also uh, I'm not sure why this one doesn't work, and it's possibly because it's possibly because I'm loading it from my local hard drive, but. <coughs> If you're loading this on a web server, you can do this. Uh, you can also disable the images. So that's good for testing things like if the image doesn't load, that you've given it a dimension so that uh, there's still the space there for the image, that you've given it alt text so that the description of what the image would be if it did load, uh, and so that it doesn't break the rest of the layout of your page. Um, what else? Uh, there's, you can resize, so if you're trying to design the interface with various different screen sizes, you can use this resize thing and create any custom dimensions that you want. So if I want to make sure that this site is still nicely visible on 1024 by 768, I can click that and it will resize the window to those exact dimensions for me. And then you've got a bunch of tools relating to validation, for example. So you can uh, click these and it will send it off to the various validation services. Uh, again, these will only work if you have your um, if you have your HTML files or if you have your files on a web server, that won't work if you're uh, opening them straight off the hard drive like I am here. Um, so that's all I'll say about that one, Web Developer Toolbar. Um, then eventually you're not going to be able to avoid the fact of having to make sure that your website works across multiple browsers. Um, possibly the most uh, time consuming and, and boring part of web design, but unfortunately a necessity. Uh, now you can download as many browsers. It's a good idea to have a few different browsers in your development environment so that you can test anyway. But there's there's no way you're going to have one machine that has every different web browser on it. So there are a few, uh, there are a couple of uh, services that exist for. I would suggest you'd use these once you're pretty sure you've got your final design taken care of, uh, for being able to test your website on uh, essentially any web browser that you can imagine. So one of them is called Browser Shots, which I have a link to here. Okay, and so essentially you enter the uh, URL of your website and you select the various different uh, web browsers that you want to test it in. So you can see it has multiple different versions of different browsers running on different platforms that you can test on. 
so normally that's not something that's kind of instant because it'll have to go through and they'll they'll render the page, save the screenshots, and then you'll get a you'll get a message when when it comes back and says, okay, we've got your uh, we've got all the screenshots of your page renderings done. So this is not something that you for that reason, it's not something you'll probably do a lot while you're developing the web page. It's probably one of the a sort of a last test for your, your completed website. A, another one similar is Adobe Browser Lab. So this loads up uh, actually a, I think a Flash application where Uh, you have to have an Adobe ID, which is easy enough to set up. So I'd say this is probably actually the better of the two tools um, at this point. This one's a bit newer and it provides you a bit nicer interface for comparing the uh, the output. So, again, same deal, you give it a address, and by default it, it gives you sort of the major web browsers uh, to render in, but then you can also select, again, a multitude of other browsers that you might want to target. And it takes a little while but it will again give you back the screenshots of, of what they look like rendered out in those browsers. The nice thing about this one is it will allow you to actually overlay them and kind of onion skin them, have each layer a bit transparent, so you can see quite clearly very subtle differences in, in the, the rendering of the web page between different uh, rendering engines, which there will undoubtedly always be, but usually you can get them within a small enough tolerance that's acceptable. So I might just leave that going rather than wait for that to do its thing. And that sort of, yeah, that sort of gets me to the, the end of the, the, the tool chain that I think are the kind of things that you will likely at some point uh, want to look into if you're, uh, if you're interested in developing an efficient process for, for web design and uh, development. And obviously, obviously, I haven't mentioned sort of the visual design tools that you're probably already used to. I'm assuming that you know you're already used to Photoshop and Illustrator and Fireworks and whatever other visual design tools that you're obviously going to use for the visual design process part. Um, so this this tool set is is really focusing on once you've got that and then you're actually uh, developing the the website. Okay, so we'll move on now to uh, talking about web hosting and domain name registration. Uh, is there anyone who actually has their own web hosting already? Excellent, lots of people, great. So this will be easy then. Um, okay, but I'll, I'll go over this anyway uh, because it's useful information. Uh, essentially, let's take it right back. I, we talk, I was talking about in the lecture that the HTTP protocol works on a client-server model. Okay, so that's just a fancy way of saying the client is your computer with your web browser. You punch in a URL and it goes and gets the, uh, the web page from a web server, whether that's an HTML file or whether that's the output from some application on the web server. There's nothing fancy about a web server. A web server is just a computer that's uh, running a particular web server application that happens to be connected to the internet 24 hours a day. You can set up any computer you want as a web server. Uh, I've indeed set up this computer as a web server. If I connect this to the, to the internet and expose my IP address publicly, then I could browse a website off my computer from essentially anywhere on the internet. So, nothing magical about a web server, but um, 
and, and you could. You could host your own web server on a computer in your house, but uh, it's going to probably take a lot of bandwidth and, and your ISP is probably not going to be happy with it. So generally the way that you always do it is there will be web hosting companies who will sell you space on one of their machines or possibly a virtual machine in a big warehouse full of, full of server computers that are just designed for hosting websites. So the two things that you need to uh, set up a website in this fashion are uh, the web hosting itself, so the space on one of those computers running that uh, web, web server software, and a domain name, which is the friendly URL that you type in, which then goes and resolves to an IP address so that people can point their browsers to your website. Now, not really supposed to recommend anything in particular, and there's so many that I probably wouldn't even do that anyway, but I've provided a list of, or I've provided some links to uh, either lists of or articles or reviews of various different web hosting companies. Uh, and then I've provided some screenshots from an example of a, a company that I've happened to use in the past. Um, not necessarily saying it's the best option, but it's an option and, and their web page is, is pretty good for explaining the kind of options that you need to select when you're choosing a web hosting package. So this is a screenshot from uh, a web hosting company called Quadra. So this is their website and you'll see their, their sort of advertising front page will generally list all of their packaging plans. So it, it can be a little bit confusing um, seeing all the different plans and going, well, which one do I need? And based on this image here, you can see that they generally scale from cheap plans to expensive plans and the cheap plans, well, the difference between a cheap plan and an expensive plan is, number one, the amount of bandwidth that your website is going to use. If you have a really, really popular website, the, the, the web hosting companies give you bandwidth limits per month. So they might say you can transfer 10 gigabytes a month to and from your website, and as soon as it goes over that, we're going to shut down access to your website until the next month rolls over. Kind of like a data cap. On, on your mobile phone plan or your internet plan. So that includes, so every, every time that someone requests your web page, then that's, that's data transferring from, to and from your web server. So that counts towards your, your bandwidth limit. Now, if, unless you, unless you, uh, you know, create the next Facebook or YouTube or something at a really popular website, um, then you're probably not going to need a huge amount of bandwidth uh, because or unless you're serving uh, really, uh, really data intense content, like you're actually hosting full movies on your website uh, for download, that sort of thing. But I say generally, uh, the most basic uh, package would suffice for uh, pretty much anyone, unless, and, and you can always upgrade later on. So a good place to start is is sort of at, at the bottom and work your way up as you need it. Uh, the other things that attribute towards more expensive plans are the amount of hard drive space that you get on that server. So again, it depends how, how, many, how many and how big of files that you want on there. HTML, PHP files are just text files, they're generally very small. So again, unless you're hosting lots of large media on your server, then you probably don't need a really expensive package. And that's pretty much, that's pretty much, oh, the, and the other thing will be the, uh, I guess, features uh, that can be installed on it. Um, so when I talk about features, uh, close that down because it didn't work, all that. Okay, so features, uh, things like um, how many, how many uh, domain names you can point to it, um, whether you have virtual or private hosting. So virtual hosting is you share a server with a bunch of other websites, which is generally the way it goes and that's fine, but there are possible security risks and possible um, uh, bandwidth abuse risks, but 
not generally something that you need to worry about. There's things like uh, number of email addresses you get. But the things that we're more concerned with are these server technologies. So whether you get things like databases, uh, support for web scripting languages, uh, those kind of things. And then usually they have sort of friendly uh, GUI interfaces to, to access uh, your data on them as well. So, let's have a look at the web hosting requirements you need to uh, do the assignment for uh, this subject. So to host WordPress site, uh, your only two real requirements are uh, having PHP uh, running on the web server and MySQL and version numbers dependent on, on, on WordPress. There's a link here to a more detailed list of requirements. Okay, and well actually they're the same they're the same requirements. There's one here called the mod mod rewrite Apache module. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. That's something that will standardly come with it uh, undoubtedly. Um, and these are actually features that, that are included with most basic plans. So if I just go back over to uh, this list of, of Quadra uh, plans, if I look at the uh, web basic one, and I go down and I look for scripting technologies, I can see that, okay, the very most basic one does not include support for PHP and does not include support for MySQL. But the very next one across, the web starter one, uh, does indeed include PHP and it allows me to have up to 10 MySQL databases. So that's perfect. That's, that's all we need. Okay, and just looking through the things that it doesn't offer, uh, things that we don't need to worry about. So if I was if I decided to go with this one for the purposes of uh, for purposes of this assignment and probably for a good deal into the future, then this web starter one uh, would probably be perfect. So in terms of cost, you can see that works out to roughly ten bucks a month or uh, hundred bucks a year. So what you notice is much like mobile phone plans, internet plans, the longer you period you sign up for, then the, the cheaper uh, the rate that you will likely get. Okay, so once you've decided on someone to purchase the web hosting with, uh, you, what to do next? You need to, you need to set it up to some degree. So what you'll get is a uh, email from the web hosting company uh, that will give you instructions and login details for everything you need to do to access and administer your website. This is an example email uh, from oops, example email from Quadra uh, with identifying information blurred out. But you can see that it uh, it gives you things like a uh, link to the control panel. The control panel being the the web interface to administer your your website with login details. Uh, it also gives you information to log in to your web web server via FTP. Okay, so these are the three bits of information that I was talking about before that you would need to put into the, the client. There's the address, which just looks like a URL, and then you'll be given a login and password. And that's pretty much it. That, that's pretty much the uh, entirety of the information that, that you need to know to, to get going uh, with, your, with, your web, with your web server. And then they'll, they'll, they'll usually give you some links to our support and so forth. So when it comes to when it comes to setting up your web hosting, I'm I'm more than happy to, to help out and and answer questions. Uh, but because there's so many different companies and the process varies, I may may not necessarily be familiar with each individual one. So the first the first thing to probably do if you're having trouble with setup is actually to email the support uh, address that they give you in the setup email, and they generally provide. Um, 
fast response and good instruction uh, to help you get it all set up. Um, because they deal with all sorts of people from really technically minded to people completely untechnically minded who just need, need to set up a website for their, their little home business. Okay, so that's the web hosting. Uh, second part is the domain name registration. So you can do these things separately. You can buy web hosting from one company and you can buy a domain name from another company. Um, now, the advantage of buying a domain name from, from another company may be that it would be slightly cheaper, but um, the cost of domain name registration is, is generally cheap compared to uh, the price of hosting, which itself is not particularly expensive. So my suggestion if you want to keep things easy is to purchase uh, a domain name and hosting from the same company uh, because then it will already be set up to link the domain name to your website and you won't have to go around configuring that. Having said that, it's not particularly difficult to, um, to point a domain name purchased from a, from a different company to your web hosting. Um, again, I've got some links to some domain name registrars, uh, price comparisons. This information may or may not be out of date. This changes, you know, all the time. Um, again, I would, I would, I would ask around for for web hosting and and domain name. I would ask around what other people have, and what their experience with it is, uh, because it's like anything. Uh, to an extent, you pay you pay for what you get. So you might find a most bargain basement plan, but their support is terrible um, and things like that. So uh, I, I would ask around, search for reviews, that kind of thing. Um, but generally you don't need to be paying a huge premium for, for these kind of things to get good service. Uh, the biggest domain name reg registrar is a company called GoDaddy. Um, so I guess the good thing with going with someone big is you know they probably won't disappear. Um, but again, you can go with pretty much anyone you want, and if uh, and if you want to go the most convenient route, again, I would probably suggest just getting a domain domain name and hosting from the same company. Uh, now, when it comes to choosing a domain, you'll pay different amounts based on the. Uh, what's called the, the top level domain. So if you want a .com address, that's going to cost you more than a .org or a .net address um, or a .com.au, .net.au. There's a list or an article here of uh, lots of different top level addresses. They pretty much opened up anything now. So you can register your domain name with anything. <coughs> but you should understand that various ones ha carry different connotations. So .com is essentially meant to be for a commercial enterprise. Uh, .NET is more generic, uh, like a network, and .org is an organization. So you'll notice that my blog, for example, is set up on if90.net. I want it to be fairly generic, and because it costs me about half as much to register .NET as opposed to .com or .com.au. So again, when you're looking at the various different options there, they'll list they'll list the uh, different um, different prices. Um, well, I can't imagine you'd really want anything other than a .NET or a .com. Um, but again, that's entirely up to you. So in the situation where you do buy your domain name separately from your web hosting, what you will need to do is uh, point the domain name to your web hosting server so that, because there needs to be a connection there when someone types in your domain that it knows that it's pointing to your web server. So the process for that, again, you should get instructions once you purchase the, the domain name, but there's generally, generally what you will get is you buy a domain name and they will give you, uh, they will give you uh, something called a name server, and usually that will be two name servers, so it'll be something like ns1. and then a URL and ns2. and a URL. And it's those URLs that you need to go into your web hosting and in the uh, control panel where you set up the domain names, you put in those name servers there and then your web hosting knows to, to get the domain name from your domain name registrar. Now that process uh, can take a couple of days or even more to actually work. So if you do that and it doesn't work straight away, 
uh, don't panic. Um, but if it's not working after, let's say, three or four days, then um, then I would suggest emailing the domain name registrar first of all uh, and, and, and asking them what's going on. But again, you can avoid actually having to do that set up just by purchasing a domain name and your hosting from the same company. Um, there's a link here actually to detailed instructions of, of how you do that, just that process. Okay, but again, that's going to vary slightly from hosting company to hosting company because they'll have slightly different interfaces to how you administer uh, the web hosting. But the principle is the same. Okay, so I've got a little FAQ here about questions that I'm quite often asked about this process of setting up a website. And I've already talked a little bit about this, um, the how much can I expect to pay for hosting plus domain name registration. And so as a rough guide, uh, as I said, you can ex for, for a package which provides the features that you need, you can expect to pay around $100 for one year of web hosting and about $10 for the registration of your domain name for the period of one year. As I said, uh, you generally get discounts for paying for longer periods. So you can if you want, if, if, uh, if you only really want to pay month by month, you can do that. And let's say there's, what, 12 weeks, three months in the, in the semester. If you really just want to cover the uh, period of time for uh, this semester, then, then you could just pay for three months, which would be about 30 bucks. Um, and just a note here, another good way to reduce the cost is by buying a hosting package that supports multiple domain names with one or more other people and each buying your own domain name. Um, so that's actually a really good, really good way of um, reducing the cost. So actually this, this blog here that I have running is um, hosted on a web server that I pay for with uh, two or three other people and we just have our own website sitting in different folders on the web server and we have our domains pointing to those different websites. So instead of each of us having to pay for a hosting package, we split that cost up by three. So instead of it costing me $100 a year, it costs me about $30 a year. And then, um, and then, well, I didn't even actually buy a domain. This is just a subdomain of the, of the one domain that we have. Uh, so if you want to do that, if there's, there's a few of you who, um, you know, don't mind sorting out the finance of, of paying for a, a shared server, then that's a really good way to uh, reduce your costs. Just remembering that if you have three websites on the one web server, then your bandwidth is probably going to be three times as much, um, which again, shouldn't, shouldn't be an issue because I doubt you will go over your bandwidth limit um, for the web server. Um, okay, so inevitably some people will always uh, be resistant to uh, paying for anything um, so it's understandable so if 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 you really are strapped to cash first of all I'd say think of it this way if you as I said if you only want to purchase hosting for the duration of the semester they can do so for about 50 bucks and even less so halve that if you split it with two people um, which is about the cost of a, a textbook or art supplies or a night out drinking, uh, none of which we require you to do for the assessment. So, um, so the, the cost can be quite low. But having said that, if you really, really don't want to purchase um, your own web hosting, then we will let you use the QUT web server. Okay, which leads to the next FAQ, which is why not just use the QUT CIF web server space? Um, there are several good reasons not to do that. First of all, websites hosted on the QUT servers require a QUT login to access. So if you want your portfolio site accessible by anyone outside of QUT, such as a prospective employer, so yes, you do, then you will need uh, external web hosting unless you want to give everyone you want to view your website, your QUT login, which you don't. <laughs> uh, number two, as I mentioned already, once you leave QUT, you'll want to migrate your portfolio to an external server anyway. So setting up an external hosting now will avoid this hassle. 
Uh, number three, the security on the QUT servers is quite locked down. You will have much more control over how your server is configured with external web hosting. So if you need to get something fixed on your external web hosting, it'll probably take a couple of days. If you want something changed on the QUT web server, first likely result is they'll tell you no. Second likely result is if they tell you yes, it'll take two months. Uh, so. So don't ex so don't expect to don't expect to be able to configure the QUT web server. You'll have to deal with what you have. Uh, and I guess I just answered question four. Any any problems that you are like that you have are likely to be dealt with much more quickly by the support staff from a good external hosting company than the QUT IT help desk. Not saying anything bad about the QUT IT help desk. It's just a huge corporation and has to go through about a hundred thousand people before anything gets approved. Um, can I use a hosting provider from another country? Uh, yes, you can. And in fact, with the uh, current uh, exchange rates, that may even be cheaper. Um, functionally, it's going to be no different. It doesn't matter where your where your web server is hosted in the world. Uh, there'll be negligible speed difference, really, geographically, uh, where it's hosted. Um, but having said that, what you do need to think about is time zone differences. Uh, if you're wanting to deal with their support, uh, particularly if it's phone support, one, it's going to cost you a lot to make an international phone call, if, if it is a phone call. And even if it's not a phone call, if it's an email, if they're in a different time zone, then there's going to be a delay. If you're emailing someone when they're asleep or when they're not in, not in business hours, then it's going to take X number of hours before they before they uh, reply to you, so there's going to be a lag there. And then also possibly, depending on where you have it hosted, there might be language barriers as well. Um, you also need to think about things like paying a foreign foreign currency. Uh, so it might be the, the the exchange rate might be good now, but you you may have uh, you may have signed up for a year or two year contract, paid by the month, calculated the exchange rate month by month and it could fluctuate wildly and end up costing a lot more. So pros and cons as there is with pretty much anything. Uh, one of the choices that you will have uh, with pretty much any hosting company is to whether to have a Unix or a Windows web server. Um, now this has nothing to do with what operating system that you actually run on your computer. This is the operating system that runs on the web server. And most websites can be, uh, it can be served from either, uh, with the exception of Microsoft technologies such as ASP, which is Microsoft's uh, web scripting language. Uh, they require a Windows web server running uh, the IIS Internet Information Services web server application. Now for us, you don't need that. Uh, you will likely never need that and because because Windows is a well, because Windows Server is a commercial application and Unix is free, you will find that hosting packages that have Windows on them are going to be more expensive because the hosting company has to pay the license for Windows. Um, so Unix is, in general, the most common uh, platform for web servers. Uh, and unless you specifically require Microsoft technologies on your server, for this subject you don't, then Unix is usually your default option. Um, so by far, the, by far the biggest proportion of web servers in the world are all powered off Unix, uh, with the exception being uh, Microsoft has a bit of a stranglehold on the enterprise, but all of your big websites that you know, Wikipedia, Google, Facebook, YouTube, they're all run off Unix servers. Um, so pretty much your choice there is Unix. Um, there's no reason to go for, for Windows at this point. Uh, can I have more than one domain pointing to my website? Yes, you can. Uh, as I said, I'm doing the exact thing with this website. Um, but you can you can actually register multiple different domains to point to your one exact website. 
So it's quite common for a company to register variations of, of their domain name uh, and even common misspellings to avoid uh, you know, different people hijacking, hijacking uh, their traffic. So for example, uh, google.net, google.biz, and even misspellings like goggle.com and google.com are all registered to Google. And if you click on any of those, those links, they will all link to Google. They'll all be redirected to google.com. Uh, so it's not necessarily something you particularly need to worry about. Um, but if you do decide to change a domain name in the, in the future, it's very easy to point that back to your same uh, website. Okay, so that's uh, web hosting. Are there any questions on that before I move on? No. Okay. Good. Uh, what I would what I would suggest uh, one of the very first things that you do look into this week before next week is uh, this whole uh, web hosting thing. Uh, the sooner you can get that set up, the better, because next week we will be installing uh, WordPress on a web server. And if you don't have it set up, uh, or if you haven't already purchased it by then, have it set up, then you're going to have to either practice that on the QT web server and then do it again later. If you already have it set up by next week, then you can just set up WordPress in the, in the tutorial and then it's done and you don't have to worry about it. So strongly suggest looking into the, the web hosting uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so uh, that was a lot of information, um, but I'm not going to say any more on that. And now we have uh, a sort of refresher exercise that I want you to do today. So lecture this week was about uh, the dynamic web, but we won't actually be getting into uh, doing anything dynamic this week because what I want to do is give you an exercise which is a bit of a HTML, CSS core principles review, just to make sure that everyone's comfortable with writing static HTML and CSS, got no problems with that um, because I want you to all have a solid foundation with that uh, so that when we're learning new processes with dy creating dynamic websites that you're not struggling thinking about how to actually do the HTML and CSS stuff as well. So the exercise is, and uh, you can have the remainder of the class and then whatever other time you need before next week to complete this. I want you to create a static HTML5 page with the following. A center aligned layout, include a tiled background image for the page body, have a header section containing a logo image that links back to this page. You can use placeholder image, no need to create a new logo. I'm not too concerned about the, the graphic design stuff. I'm more concerned about the just creating a nice clean code and layout. Uh, a heading one with the site name and align this to the bottom right of the header. Uh, underneath that I want a horizontal main navigation uh, using an unordered list of that navigation uh, with hover and active or current link states. And then I want you to have a two or three column main content section which contains a left and or a right sidebar with a vertical submenu and sidebar content and then a middle column or if you're only having two columns a, a separate column uh, for the content, which contains a heading to article title, some paragraphs of text, and feel free to use uh, a lorem ipsum generator as linked here, or any random text that you like. And somewhere amongst the paragraphs, I want you to include one left aligned image and one right aligned image, again of anything, don't really mind. Uh, and for at least one of those images, I want you to include a caption and make at least one of those images a thumbnail version of a, of a larger image that links to the full-sized image. Uh, and then a footer section with a copyright notice and contact details with a mail to email address link. Okay, and I've posted up a picture of example that oops the example that I did for this. 
Okay, as you can see, it's all just nonsense text and just grabbed a couple of uh, funny pictures of dogs and cats dressed as lobsters. And so that's the kind of layout that, that, that I want you to have. Um, as far as color schemes, whatever, I don't really care. You do whatever you want. Uh, all I want is clean code, good layout, um, good information hierarchy, and make sure that you employ all of the sort of best practices that you hopefully learned and, and used in Intro to Web. So this means things like separation of structure and style. So no tables for layouts, no use of uh, deprecated HTML attributes such as a line. All the layout stuff wants to be done as the CSS. Um, preferably have a um, either externally linked CSS file or the CSS in a block in the head. No inline styles. Uh, have semantically meaningful markup. So if you have a heading, if you have something that is a heading, make sure it's marked up as a heading element. And Resize the images in Photoshop, not in the uh, HTML or the CSS, so that you're not uh, loading unnecessary bytes of information. And including alt attributes for the images. And then once you've done that, uh, it'd be a good idea to make sure your HTML and CSS validate using the W3C HTML and CSS validator. Uh, you can just create this. Uh, you can just create this exercise on your hard drive if you want, because it is just plain HTML. Uh, but as we saw before, the linking you can't link to the URL of your web page from the the W3C validator if it's on your hard drive. But you can do validation by direct input, where you just copy and paste your HTML code in there, and then check it, and it will will tell you the validation information. Now we're not going to be we're not going to be super strict on validation for the assignments, but I want you to do it for this exercise because it's a good judge of how well you're adhering to kind of all of the other stuff. Um, okay, once you've done that, um, once you've done that, uh, all I want you to do then is complete the. Uh, HTML and CSS quizzes on W3 schools. That shouldn't take very long. It's only about 20 questions. And um, and hopefully you get most, if not all, of them right. And then finally, uh, once you've done all that, um, just review your progress. If you struggle with anything in this exercise or didn't manage to get 100% on the HTML and CSS quizzes, then I'd suggest reviewing uh, the fundamentals of HTML and CSS at, uh, again, the, the links provided here to W3 schools. Just the parts that you had trouble with, no, no need to go over stuff that you, you already had gone at. Um, and then take the quiz again. And then that's basically it. So I don't imagine this should take a, a huge amount of time, um, maybe about an hour all up. Uh, so if you if you don't get it finished, uh, if you don't get finished by the end of class, then uh, just sometimes throughout the week. Uh, but it would be good uh, if you could have that complete, so that if you do have, if you do run into any big troubles, then we can spend a little bit of time next tutorial uh, dealing with any issues that you had. Um, and then that's kind of the last thing I really want, and, and then that that'll be the last focus on plain HTML and CSS stuff. From, from that point, I'm going to assume that everyone's pretty okay, solid with writing, good, clean, uh, static HTML and CSS code. Um, okay, these posts are a little bit out of order, but they these kind of refer to the assignment stuff. So this is other stuff that you could do throughout the week, is uh, read up on some of these uh, links I provided about uh, developing a web design process. So I was kind of mentioning that when I was talking about the tools. And again, that's something that you're going to tailor individually to yourself as you progress and work on various different things. You'll find your own process, what works for you. Uh, but these articles will give you some examples of what common processes are, which might be a good place to start from and then modify to suit yourself. And then finally, I've got some links to uh, 
other galleries of uh, portfolio websites that you might want to look at. So this is this is stuff that you can start on the assignment now. Is is the initial research, looking what's out there. Um, uh, so there's there's the obviously the the student student previous student works that I've posted, uh, but then also other galleries that have been sort of aggregated by other people and deemed as 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 good examples of portfolio websites for one reason or another.